Maybe 
joining us today. We're uh, so glad that you can spend some time with us. Uh, we're continuing our discussion of Mark, and we're going to be in chapter 9 today. And as you're flipping on over there, um, who's familiar with a man by the name of George Washington Carver? Uh, Matt is. Uh, Carver was born, Lauren is. Carver was born into slavery sometime in the mid-1860s, we think somewhere around uh, 63, 64. But as the Civil War came to a close, his family was able to overcome. Uh, they were able to find their freedom, and they knew pretty quickly that there was something special about George. He would later become a brilliant scientist, but... What put his name into the American history books was his discovery of not peanuts, but the uses for peanuts. He discovered over 300 uses for the peanut. Uh, from the peanut plant, he developed um, ink and ice cream and bread and cosmetics and dyes, candy, soap, sausages, oils. Uh, through the peanut, he found substitutes for flour, cheese, even coffee. But the greatest discovery of this brilliant, brilliant man was, can you guess it? Peanut butter. Uh, George Washington Carver's desire was not necessarily to make peanut butter, but to make humankind better. He wanted to aid all of humankind. But what's most important that through his life, he accomplished incredible things, but he didn't hold that up to being uh, something that was of him. He gave all that glory to God. Listen to how he describes his own uh, amazing accomplishments. He says, when I was young, I said to God, God, tell me the mystery of the universe. He answered, that knowledge is reserved for me alone. So I said, God, tell me the mystery of the peanut. Then God said, well, George, that's more your size. And he told me everything I know about the humble peanut. He's one of those people that's just kind of a picture of humi uh, humility. And if we're really honest, we all know people who are like that, who are very humble people. And the Bible is very clear about the necessity of having humility in our lives. Uh, unfortunately, Humility is the polar opposite of what the world says. The world says that we need to be uh, self-sufficient, that we need to be self-assured, that we need to make sure that we feel good about ourselves. We need to make sure that we are number one, that we are the most important. But there's a real danger in that pursuit. William Barclay, uh, he's a British... Uh, commentary writer and author, he says this, the higher up we find ourselves in terms of power, influence, and wealth, the more vulnerable we are to pride, and the more prone we are to being blind to our own spiritual needs and deficiencies. The subtle uh, encroachment of pride will render us useless to God and others more than any other kind of sin. And the danger of pride is that it manifests itself in many subtle and lethal ways. And from a biblical perspective, uh, pride is not what makes you great. It's humility. If anyone wants to be first, we're taught that you must be last. They must become a servant of all. And it's having this perspective that we'll be looking at today but first, let's have the praise team read this morning's Bible passage, pray for our time together, and continue leading us in worship. Today's scripture reading comes from Ephesians 4, 2 through 4. Always be humble and gentle. Be patient with each other, making allowances for each other's faults because of your love. Make every effort to keep yourselves united in the Spirit, binding yourselves together with peace. For there is one body and one spirit, just as you have been called to one glorious hope for the future. Love. 
if you're just now tuning in, we are in Mark, and I'd like to do a little recap because all of this, you know, to us has been talked about over the past several weeks, but this is all really kind of happening in a pretty short amount of time. In Mark chapter 8, uh, we see this very, this transition happening in Jesus' ministry. You know, they're in Caesarea Philippi. Uh, he's talking with the disciples um, very directly about what's about to happen. And he promised that, yes, he is the promised Messiah that is talked about and prophesied about in the Old Testament. But then in his next breath, he explains that he's not come as the Messiah to be a conquering king like they had all expected, but rather that the promised Messiah would suffer and die at the hands of leaders, men in leadership. But then after three days, he says that he'll be raised from the dead. And then to add to their anxiety in a lot of ways, Jesus explains that his followers will also have to carry their own crosses and that they too will have to deny themselves and they will have to suffer just for being his followers. But here's the good news. Uh, by following Jesus, they're told that they'll get to be in the very presence of God. And then after you know several days of mulling that over, uh, in Mark 9, God proved that all this was true. Um, the disciples, when they were at their very lowest, Jesus takes Peter, James, and John uh, up to the top of this mountain, and there's this, this uh, story of the transfigura transfiguration. And in that, they get to see Jesus' full divinity. This is the mountaintop experience of all mountaintop experiences. But they couldn't stay there forever. Mountaintop experiences don't last forever. They had to return to the real everyday life. So when Jesus arrives back at the bottom of the mountain with Peter, James, and John, he finds that the other nine disciples, uh, they're struggling. They're in this argument because they have failed to cast out an evil spirit from this child. Uh, and Jesus, after healing this child, explains to them why. He explains why they had failed. It seems that they were trying to cast out this spirit using their own power. They had failed to depend on Christ when they needed to depend on Christ the most. They had failed even to pray, which is kind of, you know, the foundation of what faith is built upon. Essentially, it was their pride. It was their self-sufficiency that resulted in their inability to cast out this demon, which leads to uh, what we're going to be talking about today, what happens next in verse 30 and following of Mark 9. And listen for Jesus' challenge to what it means to live humbly. Leaving that region, they traveled through Galilee. Jesus didn't want anyone to know where he, uh, he was there, for he wanted to spend more time with his disciples and to teach them. He said to them, the Son of, God, the Son of Man is going to be betrayed into the hands of his enemies. He will be killed, but three days later he will rise from the dead. They didn't understand what he was saying. However, they were afraid to ask him what he meant. After they arrived in Capernaum and settled in a house, Jesus asked his disciples, What were you discussing out on the road? But they didn't answer, because they had been arguing about which of them was the greatest. He sat down called the twelve disciples over to him and said, Whoever wants to be first must take last place and be the servant of everybody else. Then he put a little child among them. Taking the child in his arms, he said to them, Anyone who welcomes a little child like this on my behalf welcomes me. And anyone who welcomes me welcomes not only me, but also my Father who sent me. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for stories like this, as it is really easy in this uh, world where we're told that success and money and power are uh, all goals that we're trying to attain. It's good to have passages like this where we're reminded of the value of humil humility. And God, I ask that you help us 
as we discuss everything that's going on, to have a more personal understanding of what this means, not just in the bigger picture sense, but what it means for us. How can we be more humble as a people? It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So, this passage uh, is huge, especially in light of what has transpired for the disciples over the past week or so. You know, these three, like I just said, they had just witnessed this incredible, this glorious transfiguration. Uh, then they all, all 12 of them, got to see, witness this uh, healing of a demon-possessed child, uh, a child that they couldn't heal because of their own lack of faith. Yet, in spite of this amazing display of glory and power and love, you can't be helped but be taken back by what's going on here. Think about the contrast here in different statements. In verse 31, Jesus is talking about being betrayed and arrested and killed and then raised back to life. But in verse 34, the disciples are talking about uh, when they get to know who's the greatest, when they get to know who's going to sit at Jesus' right and left. You know, their inability to understand here is incredible. And I like to say that I would have known better, but I probably wouldn't have. But while Jesus is preparing for his crucifixion, the disciples are, in a lot of ways, the disciples are picking out their thrones and their crowns and wondering who's going to be in this place of power. And this is all about pride. So how does Jesus deal with pride in his followers? You know, he roots it out. And he roots it out by reminding him of the importance of humility. So how do we grow in humility? Well, I think the first thing and the most important thing is that we have to be impacted by the ultimate display, the ultimate demonstration of humility. Let's read verses 30 again. From there they went out and began to go through Galilee, and he did not anyone else to know about it, for he was teaching his disciples and telling them that the Son of Man is to be delivered into the hands of men, and that they would kill him. And when he was being killed, he'd be raised three days later. But they didn't understand this statement, and they were afraid to ask. So Jesus and the disciples, they're on this road for some personal training. You know, this is rabbi uh, to disciples kind of teaching. You know, they're traveling back now to the city of Capernaum. Uh, this was the home for many of the disciples. But this is only the beginning of this journey. You know, Capernaum is just a stop on the road to Jerusalem. And these followers, they need to be prepared for what's about to happen. They need to be prepared for what's about to happen to Jesus. They need to be prepared for what's about to happen during this time of physical separation from him. They need to be trained for uh, the upcoming world-changing ministry that they're about to start. But Jesus also knows that pride is really blossoming in a lot of their hearts. So as they travel, Jesus is plainly describing what's about to happen. He says, the Son of Man is to be delivered into the hands of men, and they will kill him. And when he has been killed, he will be raised again three days later. This is the second time that Jesus has very plainly revealed why God became a man. That the promised Messiah, that God in human form, was born in order to die. But death will not hold Christ up. He explains that three days later he will be raised from the dead, having accomplished Salvation for people, all those who believe in him. Now notice how important this teaching is to Jesus. Beginning of verse 31, for he was teaching his disciples. That word for uh, is a connective word. That's connecting the, this verse with the previous verse. He's telling us that Jesus in verse 30, he didn't want all of his other people in the area, he didn't want his presence to be known to them, because Jesus was seeking some uninterrupted time with his disciples in order to teach what he needed to. 
He wanted to instruct them. He wanted to expose them to God's word. He wanted to describe to them what God is really like. And he wanted them to know what God really values. And the phrase in verse 31, he was telling them, this points out that Jesus is talking to them about Jerusalem and everything that's about to happen there. But this is an ongoing discussion. This is an ongoing discussion about a crucial event. And then he explains that the Son of Man will be delivered into the hands of men. Now, like I said, this is the second time where Jesus has talked about what's coming, what's going to happen in Jerusalem. But here he's sharing something new. This is a new little piece of the, the puzzle. He reveals that the promised Messiah will be betrayed. In other words, this isn't going to be some accidental death. This isn't going to be something that just happens because um, they were in the wrong place at the wrong time. That he's going to be delivered. Paradidati. This literally translates to the idea of being handed over. That the Son of Man is to be handed over into the hands of these ruling authorities. This verb, delivered, is also in a futuristic present tense. Giving it that this is a sense of certainty. This is going to happen. There's nothing that you or me can do about it. It's going to happen. But there's also a passive voice that's here. That there's an agent that's behind it. And the same term, delivered, is used to describe God himself delivering up Jesus for our redemption. In Acts chapter 2, it makes very clear, in accordance with his own plan, God had already decided that Jesus would be handed over to you. And you killed him by letting sinful men crucify him. And then Paul uses it this way. He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him over for us all. So by a willful, premeditated, evil act, God's own children will betray Christ. But that's only because God permits it. These people will intentionally and knowingly seek to murder Jesus, but it's only because it was God's will that he die for our sins, for the sins of all of his children. God initiated this action before humanity even began, and it was his plan from the beginning. Then in verse 31, he concludes, and he will raise... He will rise three days later. Jesus always kept death and resurrection together. Jesus doesn't just physically die. He's also resurrected. He doesn't merely die. He lives again. You know, his death isn't the end. It's only the beginning. But his disciples, they still don't get it. And worse, they're afraid to ask. They're afraid to ask for what all this means. Verse 32, but they didn't understand this statement, and they were too afraid to ask him. The Greek word here, uh, agneo, means not understand. It means that it escaped them. They're still ignorant to what God is doing through the Son. After three years, they still haven't figured it out. They continue to picture that the Messiah, this Deliverer, would come and free them from Roman power, not from the bondages of sin. They refuse to take off their old glasses. They refuse to see Jesus as anything other than a ruling king like David, the promised Messiah. And they refuse to put on the new glasses, which talked about a suffering Messiah, a suffering servant, clearly into focus. And Matthew says that the disciples were also deeply grieved in his telling of this story, that they were deeply grieved. That's part of the reason why the verse 32 ends with, and they were fr afraid to ask him. I mean, when it's happy news, we all want to know, right? When there's happy news, everybody wants to know more about what's going on. But when it's sad news, you don't. 
when it's heartbreaking news, you don't want more details. You just are kind of done. So the disciples were afraid to ask. They didn't want to know more information. But that didn't change the reality of what Christ is about to do. And what he was about to do was the ultimate expression of humility. Romans 5, 6, For while we were still helpless at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. But God demonstrates his own love towards us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. What Jesus did on the cross was the ultimate display of humility. You see, humility at its very core is dying to self. It's serving others. It's giving yourself away. It's seeking what's best for the other people in your life. And the path to greatness has to do with this idea of denying yourself. But the disciples struggled. Even on the night, even on the night before Jesus was crucified, the twelve were again arguing about the same thing. The night before Jesus was crucified, they were arguing again about who is going to be the greatest. The greatest. I want to know who's going to be top boss when Jesus is gone. He keeps saying he's going somewhere. I don't want to know more about that. But what I want to know about is who's going to be the boss? Who's going to be the one calling the shots? So what does Jesus do then? He removes his outer garment. He takes a bucket of water and he begins to wash the disciples' feet. The incarnate God, the same God who was just hours of way from a miserable, painful trial and punishment and execution for our sins is washing the feet of these pride-filled disciples. John reveals in chapter 13, If I then, the Lord and the teacher, washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I gave you an example that you also should do as I did to you. But for now, the meaning of humility and Jesus' coming death completely escaped the disciples. So Jesus has to expose the problem with lacking humility in their lives. Verse 33, they came to Capernaum. And when he was in the house, he began to question them. What were you discussing on the way? But they kept silent. For on the way they had discussed with one another, which of them was the greatest. How subtle is pride in our lives? How disgusting is pride? Bonhoeffer uh, spoke about this when he was speaking to a church in Harlem. He said, Pride is the worst sin. There is no other matter in which the heart is more deceitful. Pride is God's most stubborn enemy. There is no sin so much like the devil as pride. Just after Jesus has described the coming cross. His disciples are arguing about their, their own crowns and their own thrones. And immediately after Jesus announces this coming death, they're arguing about their privileges and who's going to get to do what. And I can't imagine. I mean, try to put yourself in Jesus' shoes. I mean, in some ways we can't because Jesus was 100% God. But he was also 100% human. So try to put yourself in his shoes. He's thinking about what is about to happen. It's just a very short time away before this horrible thing is about to happen. Pain, like we can't even begin to imagine, not just physical, but emotional and spiritual pain is about to be cast upon him. And I can't imagine, after revealing what's about to happen, that all your disciples can do is worry about who's in charge, that who's the big man on campus. 
I can't imagine how hurtful this was to Jesus. I mean, his soul was already burdened, but this just adds to it. And Mark records this story, that the one another phrase is emphatic. This was not, this was a, a hot discussion. This wasn't just a casual discussion amongst them. They were arguing about this. The disciples were serious and they were arguing about who gets to be the boss. Mark seems to indicate that this was, that Jesus was walking out in front. Uh, he was probably alone, probably considering everything that's about to happen, and then grouped behind him as if they were in the back of the bus. You remember back to your school days, back when they had buses? They still have school buses? I don't know. But back when I was in school, we had school buses. And he had all the bad kids, where I usually was, was in the back of the bus. And they're all back there in the very back. They're fighting over position. They're trying to claim their place in the coming kingdom. They were pushing for a higher rank and seeking to see who was going to be first. They're arguing over which one is going to be the greatest. And we've all done it on some level, right? We all probably still battle with it in some way. Remember when you had to be the first in line? Or you wanted to be the first one, even if you weren't any good at sports, you still wanted to be the first one that was chosen for kickball, or you wanted to be acknowledged as employee of the month. You wanted to be the first one to get your food in line, first to take off from the traffic light, first to get the new gadget, first to go to the new movie, first of your friends to ride the new ride at Disneyland. The disciples wanted to be first. They wanted to be first in Christ's kingdom. They wanted to be in those places of power. They wanted to have chief seats. They wanted to be like the scribes in the synagogue that had these seats of power and influence. They were preoccupied with rank and honor. Peter and James and John, I'm sure they were claiming those first seats, right? Because they were the ones that had just gotten to go up. They were specially selected to go up to that mountain of transfiguration and see this incredible thing happen. And Peter, his was named by Jesus, the rock. So it's got to be me. I'm the rock. I'm number one. I'm what everybody else can build everything around. Me. And then James and John say, no, 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 no. We're the sons of thunder. It's going to be us. And then the other nine are all chiming in. It may even be that in all this talk of Jesus' coming death, they want to know who the successor is going to be. Who's going to be the one that isn't just sitting at the right and left of Jesus, but who gets to take Jesus' place? But Jesus saw right into their hearts. So as they arrive in Capernaum, Jesus wants to expose their pride. Verse 33, they came to Capernaum, and when he was in their house, he began to question them, what were you discussing on the way? Jesus gives them the opportunity here to confess. But I'm sure they were ashamed. How couldn't you be? They knew what they were doing was wrong, was inappropriate. So in verse 34, they kept silent. For on the way they had discussed with one another, which of them was the greatest? That term greatest in the Greek means to magnify. Who will be living largest, right? Who will sit on Christ right and left? Who is going to be mightiest in Jesus' eyes? But in God's kingdom, greatness is not found in being first. Greatness in Christ's kingdom is found in humility. And humility doesn't focus on self, but rather on serving. True greatness is thinking more about God and God's things and God's ways than thinking about yourself. Take Paul, for example, as an example of humility. Now, Paul, he had lots of reasons to be proud. Uh, he was easily... Of all the disciples, he was the most educated. Um, probably out of all the early church leaders, he was the most educated. He was educated under the most respected rabbi of the time. 
a rabbi who sat on the Sanhedrin, and he had an incredible education. He got to be a part of everything that was going on. He was also commissioned directly by Jesus on the road to Damascus. And then he was there. He was the one that was trusted to take the gospel to the Greco-Roman world. But Paul said, this is what Paul thought of himself with regard to all this. 1 Corinthians, I am the least of the apostles. And then four years later, he says in Ephesians, I am the very least of all the saints. And then when he's talking to his uh, protege, to his own disciple, Timothy, he says, I am the foremost of sinners. And as the years pass, Paul thinks less and less of himself while he's thinking increasingly more of Jesus. Or think about John the Baptist. And John the Baptist had a large following. He had his own disciples. He knew that he was chosen by God to prepare the way for the coming Messiah. But then he says this in John 30, He must increase, but I must decrease. That's humility. So how do we grow in humility? Well, Jesus thankfully gives us some pretty specific and pretty clear answers. He instructs us on how to develop humility in our own lives. If you really want to be great in God's eyes, then you have to ask yourself and try and be really honest here. Try and be as honest as you can. Who am I really trying to please? Whenever I'm doing something, whenever I'm thinking something, whenever I'm acting in a certain way, who am I really trying to please? And then ask yourself, how can I make the biggest impact for Christ in my everyday life? Well, you start by obeying what Jesus says in verse 35. We're told, he sat down. He called the twelve disciples over to him. And he said, whoever wants to be first must take last place and be the servant of everybody else. Then he put a little child among them. Taking this child in his arms, he said to them, Anyone who welcomes a little child like this on my behalf welcomes me. And anyone who welcomes me not only welcomes me, but also welcomes my Father who sent me. So how do you develop humility? Especially in this world, this world that is so consumed with self. How do you develop humility? Well, first, you have to serve others before yourself. You have to serve others before yourself. Now, I'm not talking about doing your chores. I'm not talking about taking out the trash. I'm not talking about putting gas in your wife's car. Those are nice things to do. Those are things that you should do, but that's not what we're talking about. We must continually be on the lookout for ways to serve. That means we have to be okay with being last in this very me-first world. Mark 9.35, sitting down, he called the the twelve and said to them, If anyone wants to be first, they shall be last and a servant of all. So here we read that Jesus sat down. Now this is what rabbis would do. Whenever they are teaching in an official capacity, they wouldn't stand like I'm doing. They would sit down. Maybe I should start sitting down while I speak. I don't know. That'd be weird. But Mark tells us, that Jesus sat down and calls the twelve to come around him and to listen. Then he asks, who is the greatest in God's eyes? What behavior does Jesus desire from his people? What are the actions to bring, that bring a huge smile to God's face? Verse 35, whoever wants to be first must be last and must become a servant of everybody else. So no matter who you are, if you are a genuine believer, this goes for anyone of any age, with any amount of money, living anywhere in the world. If you are a believer, if you are a follower of Jesus, you and I are called to radical servanthood. This is the way to true greatness in God's eyes. Jesus tells his followers that what matters most is not being top dog. What matters most is to intentionally seek ways 
to put others' needs before your own. Jesus says, anyone, anyone can pursue being great in my eyes. Being first is not evil, as long as you're trying to be first the way that I designed. And Jesus' way of being first is by being last. It's admirable to desire to being great in God's eyes as long as we're doing it His way. So let's look at that way. There are two parts to it. It says, They shall be last of all and servant of all. Last of all. This is a deliberate choice, right? We must voluntarily assume the position of being last in our own circle. And that doesn't mean when you're at the potluck that... You don't eat until everybody else eats. I mean, that's nice. You can do that. I appreciate it. But that's not what it's necessarily talking about. We must voluntarily assume in the position of being last, it's choosing to let others go first in a variety of ways in our life. It's lifting someone else's efforts up more than our own. We have to love being last in a me-first world. And then we're told that we have to be a servant of all. We must demonstrate our voluntary service to others. Now the word servant here is not describing a slave. That's not what this is talking about. A slave, they don't have a choice in what they do. But rather, being a servant, an attendant who renders a free service to others. A servant is describing a service that's being rendered rather than something that's being forced. True humility is not self-deprecation. It's, or humiliation even. It's the attitude of unselfishness. It's an attitude of self-forgetfulness, which seeks the welfare of other people before our own. And Jesus says that being last and a service was to all. So this selective service, this being last and being a servant, isn't just for your friends. It's not just for your family. It's not just for your favorite people, but to all. So this is for friends and strangers. This is for popular and lowly people. Service is not the only passport to developing humility, but also the very essence of greatness in Christ's kingdom. So here's one of those introspective questions. Uh, it can be kind of tough to ask, especially if we're being honest with ourselves. Do I really serve? I want you to ask yourself that question in this moment of silence. Do I really serve? There's no doubt that you're commanded to serve, and the call to serve doesn't expire. It's something that doesn't expire with age or position or wealth. Your Savior calls you to serve, and the only way you can kill pride is to develop humility. And you can only develop humility by this desire to serve. So the question is, do I really serve? In Galatians, Paul says, For you have been called to live in freedom, but don't use your freedom to satisfy your sinful nature. Instead, use your freedom to serve one another in love. So we're called to be like Christ, and he came not to rule, but to serve. In Mark 10, 45, For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. So, are you here this morning to be served or to serve? Are you here uh, when you're watching this in a virtual space? Are you listening so that your needs can be served or because you want to serve? We're all called to seek to be last and to serve others And the first key to developing humility is this. It's exactly that thing. But the second one is to care for those in need. 
Look carefully what Jesus says in verse 36. Then he put a little child among them. Taking the child into his arms, he said to them, Anyone who welcomes a little child like this on my behalf, my behalf welcomes me. And anyone who welcomes me welcomes not only me, but also my Father who sent me. You know, this is kind of a tender moment, right? We don't often get to see Jesus in these nurturing, tender moments. Uh, as Jesus sits there, he picks up this kid, uh, turns the kid around so that it's facing the, the, the group, the disciples. He cradles this small child in his arms. And there's a very strong possibility that this was one of Peter's kids. Let's look carefully. Whoever receives one child like this in my name receives me. Now, a child was the least significant person in the Jewish and Roman cultures. Children weren't fond after. They weren't seen as being uh, someone to even really be protected. They were considered weak. Or in this passage, they were last. So Jesus is saying that accepting, serving, caring for such a child by caring for those who are the lowest on the social ladder is what it means to be a servant of all. Verse 37, whoever receives, the Greek word here means to accept, to embrace, to care. And then Jesus adds, when you do that, when you accept, embrace, care for one of these, these lowly people, you're doing it in my name. When the weakest and lowliest purpose person is embraced by you, it's because you understand they already belong to Christ. And then Jesus makes it even stronger by saying, whoever receives me does not receive me, but him who sent me. So when you care for and when you embrace the lowly, you're not only being humble, but you're also welcoming God the Father. And through welcoming these lowly and needy people into your life, you're also welcoming God into your life. And that's awesome. As you welcome in the outsider, Jesus says that the Father welcomes, accepts, cares, and embraces you. And that's what it means to be the greatest, is to have God embracing and welcoming you. So are you humble? Are you growing in humility? Jesus told us in order to develop humility, you are to regularly and faithfully choose to serve. In other words, stop sitting on the sidelines and get in the game. A biblical church is made up of participants, not spectators. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you. I ask that you help us all to find proactive, meaningful ways to serve those who are in need. And I ask God that you help us as your followers to understand the value and the necessity of humility in our lives. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. We'll talk to you again next time. Mm -hmm.